This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by the team at Lechuza, suppliers of self-watering pots and planters. Lechuza brings decades of experience in state-of-the-art precision manufacturing to bear on its stylish, high-functionality range of planters. All Lechuza products are designed in-house and manufactured in the same factory as the iconic Playmobil toys. The complete collection comes in a wide variety of traditional and trend-led colours and shapes, and they're highly reliable for use both indoors and outdoors. The integrated soil irrigation system ensures that the plant receives the perfect amount of water for optimal growth. Thanks to a reservoir that always holds enough water and is controlled by a water level indicator, dried out or overwatered root bales are a thing of the past. Find out more by visiting lechuza.co.uk. Today's guest is Mary McKenzie, fashion historian, writer and curator, whose research looks at the relationship between the clothes that we wear and our culture. Her latest research is into the world of scent and what flower could be more intrinsically linked with perfume than the rose. In the interview, we discuss famous rose-based perfumes, the symbolism behind its use, whether it's historically been perceived as a feminine scent, the mysterious workings of the Osmotech, and why that rose perfume you made as a child never worked. I begin asking Mary how she came to look at the role of the rose in perfume. Okay, so I'm a historian. I studied history at Glasgow University, and now I am research fellow in history at Glasgow School of Art. I work in the School of Design there. I, What I research though, all my research interests have their roots in the obsessions of my youth. So I research fashion, music, and the thing we're here to talk about today, which is perfume. And I look at all of those things through the lens of popular culture and everyday life. Yes, so I did watch a talk of yours and you mentioned that you used to work selling perfumes. Were you always interested in that side of things? So when I was a teenager, I got a job in a local chemist, which I thought was the most glamorous place in town. It sold perfumes by Chanel, Guerlain, Givenchy, uh, Makeup Elizabeth Arden. And I worked there from the ages of 14 to 17. And that's where I really learned about perfume and was able to get my hands on perfume rather than getting fakes from semi-chem and I just really versed myself in each of the perfume houses their different styles their histories and from then on I've had a keen interest in it but only more recently has it become part of and now I'm writing a book about perfume for Bloomsbury which will hopefully come out next year and it's called Perfume and Fantasy and it's about scent in popular culture and everyday life. Wow, it's such an amazing area. It fascinates mm. me. Did you have a favourite scent when you were working? In oh, yeah, it was Lulu, <laughs> which I hate now. <laughs> and I used to absolutely douse myself in it. So in magazines at the time, which were really didactic about the ways you should wear perfume, where your pulse points were, how you should layer it. So I used to have the shower gel, the body lotion, the talcum powder, the shampoo, the deodorant and the perfume. And I used to spray it all over myself. And one of my friend's mums begged me to stop wearing it when I came to the house. And like friends, it was disgusting. I could, well, it's not disgusting. I just wore too much of it. And even now if I smell it, it makes me feel quite sick. But yeah, Lulu was the, the perfume that I loved. Yeah. Oh, it, well, that and that is, yeah, it's definitely, it's quite sort of strong anyway, isn't it? So. Hugely. <laughs> and especially that teenage tendency to wear far too much perfume anyway. Yeah, yeah. I did. I was a bit of a fan of white musk myself. Oh, I love white musk as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so talking about the kind of role of roses in perfume, um, mm-hmm. does anybody know when they first began to be used in fragrance? Yes. I mean, there are there's evidence of it being used as far back as 13th century BC, and that would be in the region around the Peloponnese. And also around this time, the Persian and Babylonian empires were renowned for their use of rose and its aromatic oils. And they had active industries in that area. Um, Then moving on, the next big advances in the world of rose, it came with the development of steam distillation to extract the aromatic properties of plants plants and flowers. Before that, it would have been extracted by using fats and oils. And this is credited to the Persian physician and polymath Ibn Sina. Um, Although evidence is 
now come out that it was found essentially earlier by another Persian physician called Al Razi. And were they using a specific species of rose and was that only grown in certain areas? Yes, it would probably have been the Damask rose, Mm -hmm. which, as the name suggests, originates from around about Syria. Um, But all through the Persian Babylonian empires, then through the Arabian empires, North Africa, Bulgaria, Turkey, were all areas that um, were abundant in the Damask rose at that time. And would it have been an expensive luxury ingredient? Um, I think it would have been expensive in that you wouldn't use it every day if you weren't rich. But say, for example, in the Roman Empire, rose scents, rose oils and rose waters were used by everyone. So even if you weren't that rich, you would still use them, but in more sparing quantities than, say, at the banquet of the Emperor Nero. It was just a question of degrees. Mm. And the, uh, something that's just occurred to me is if it was used in a culture in culinary, if mm-hmm. it was in culinary use, would it also have been used as a fragrance for people or were yes. the two kind of mutually exclusive? No, um, they would have been used across the board to fragrance your home, to fragrance yourself in food, to anoint royalty, to symbolise gods. So there were a wide range of symbolic and practical uses for the rose in many different cultures. And actually, that was a question I had, which which I took out because I wasn't sure it made complete Mm -hmm. kind of sense. But do roses or were roses used as much for their symbolism as for their scent, do you think? Yeah, they're deeply symbolic. They are often associated in ancient cultures with gods, especially gods of love. I mean, perfume and rose scent, it isn't just an object, it's a complex sort of social and cultural phenomenon. So it's had hugely varied, shifting and sometimes contradictory connotations. So say, for example, throughout the history of the Christian church, the early Christian church did not want anything to do with scent or rose scents because they associated it with the debauchery of pagan idolatry, in particular the sort of paganism and debauchery of the Romans. But as time went on, it took on new meanings. And within the Christian church, the white rose came to symbolise the Virgin Mary. Rose and rosemary were sometimes used to um, fire and brimstone. Instead of fire and brimstone, they would use rose and rosemary. It would be worn in garlands at Christian feasts. But also it could be seen as a sign of the devil. So at the Luden witchcraft trials, for example, um, there was a demonic possession that was supposedly the result of a bunch of roses being thrown into the local nunnery. And the devil got into the bodies of the nuns through that. So you have all these wildly different connotations and symbolism going on within one perfume. Mm, that's amazing. So would that have been cyclical? So would it kind of gone in and out of fashion or or would it gone in and out of different connotations depending on the time or was it just specific to the culture? Sometimes they had contradictory connotations at the same time within the same culture. So, I mean, within Christianity, like I said there, the idea that the devil could get into a nun's body through a bunch of roses is at odds with the idea that the Virgin Mary is symbolised by the white rose. But both of those things coexisted at the same time. Mm. And would it have been specific to the colour as well? Would that have had an influence on what the... Probably. Yeah. Probably. Red is definitely has a much more um, carnal connotation than something like white. And what does the rose scent um, connote in today's society? Do we know? Well, I think if you look at perfume adverts now, especially perfumes that contain predominantly rose, they tend to depict depict a certain type of woman, somebody who's very fair, young, beautiful. The imagery is very romantic, so it's usually quite soft and blurred. Um, so it's associated with romance a lot. It's associated with purity. Although you do get a lot of rose scents, which are very spicy and rich and much more seductive in their um, imagery. Would it be fair to say that maybe the more rose scent that's in a perfume the the kind of more innocent it's regarded? I think it depends on what it's blended with. So, for example, you have a perfume like Portrait of a Lady by Frederick Mal, which is a really high concentrate of rose in it. 
which is blended with patchouli and clove and cinnamon and various other quite heavy spices. And in that context, the rose becomes more rich and seductive. Then you have something like Beautiful by Estee Lauder, which is much lighter, um, much pinker in its imagery as well. So all of those things come together to connote purity. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I suppose it depends on the marketing campaign to a yeah. degree. Yeah, it really does. Although if you ask somebody if they like rose, a lot of them will associate it with their granny or, you know, a face cream that their mum used. It tends to come in and out of fashion and a lot of perfumes contain rose and people don't realise it. So mm. they might associate rose with being a particular scent, but there is no such thing as a singular rose scent. It really depends upon the type of rose used in the perfumery and also the terroir. So it changes according to the climate, the soil, the aspect, so on and so forth, in much the same way as it does with wine and olive oil. Wow, that's interesting. I've never thought of that. Um, yeah. So going back to kind of how it people are perceived when they're wearing it, um, I thought mm-hmm. it was really interesting to talk about whether rose has always been perceived as a feminine scent. Not always. Um, As with many of our persistent customs, my research is in Britain, mostly Scotland, but Britain generally, the idea of the rose being gendered came about with the Victorians. And they were really explicit about this, that roses and other flowers became associated with femininity. Then men would only be concerned with flowers from a botanical or scientific point of view. In modern society, we do think of the rose as a feminine scent. So Yeah, we definitely do. Although there are many male scents, or those that are marketed towards men, that contain rose. And something like Adamus 900, or Lego East by Chanel, or Noir de Noir by Tom Ford, or Amouage Lyric, they all contain rose. So you might not recognise it immediately as being there, but it's a, a persistent component within masculine perfumery as well also in periods when men weren't supposed to wear rose scents they still found a way to get it into everyday life so it would either be via a buttonhole or it could be scented snuff in the victorian period and this might be delving too far in this into the chemistry side of it but is it a useful ingredient in a perfume in terms of kind of fixing the other smells it would definitely add a particular vein through the perfume but it like any recipe I suppose it depends what you put it with and it will take on quite different characteristics also perfume has been isolated and oh, sorry roses have been isolated into different components so you could extract certain molecules from the rose and then put that into a perfume to underline or enhance other ingredients that you have in there it's very rare to find a perfume that is just rose even if it's marketed as such it will have other ingredients in there to enhance or to balance out the central um central ingredient of rose yeah you mentioned a scent i think you were wearing it when you gave your talk but it was called un rose oh yes un rose by edward fleshy for frederick mal you would assume from that that was purely rose but i'm guessing there's other stuff in that yes it's Rose with a truffle accord, so truffles that you find on the, on the forest floor, um, and it smells like a complete rose. So it has the petals, it has the stem, it has the leaves, and it has the earth. That is fantastic. I love the idea of that. And can you also mention what other perfumes he was responsible for? Because I think people will know them and recognise them. Oh, yes. So he also created Poison by Christian Dior, Aqua de Gio, and Davidoff. Mm, really famous scents. Um, yes. Does poison have any rose in it? Poison is mainly tuberose, which, as you know, isn't related to the rose. It's more closely related to jasmine. Let me just look up poison and see if it has. There's an amazing website called Fragrantica that lists all the ingredients that they can identify in every scent, and then users leave their reviews for the perfume it's fascinating just the myriad ways in which people can um interpret the same scent i love that website i go on there and look up the scents that i like wearing and it's amazing it is it's just fantastic because there's such experts of people that comment on there 
Oh, they really are. And so lyrical in the way that they describe the perfumes. It really does take you somewhere else. And I think it's a great way of seeing that the marketing of the perfume doesn't always have any bearing upon how people interpret it. Well, I've just found out rose is in poison. Ah, It's a small component. Right. I mean, that's a really divisive fragrance, isn't it, poison? Yeah. (laughs) I love it. A lot of people don't. (laughs) Much like I wore Lulu, lots of girls at school, you know, it's such a deeply inappropriate perfume for a 13 or 14 year old (laughs) just walking about in their school uniform. But yeah, it was hugely popular at the time. Um, And what are some other kind of heavily rose based, you mentioned Portrait of a Mm -hmm. Lady and Beautiful, but are there any others that people might have heard of? Well, I would say any of the perfumes created by a perfumer called Sophia Groschman, and she created Beautiful for Estee Lauder, Paris for Yves Saint Laurent and Tresor for Longcombe. So she is known as the Queen of Roses. So anything made by her. Also, you know, Chanel Number no. Five has rose in it. Joy by Jean Patou has rose in it as well. Although you might not immediately recognise that. I'm wearing a perfume just now. I'm wearing Portrait of a Lady by Frederick Mal. But also, I wear a perfume by Comme de Garcon, which is their original Comme de Garcon eau de parfum. It smells like a Christmas potpourri, or at least that's what my mum says when she smells it on me. But it has a strong element of rose in it, but it's very much blended with the clove and the cinnamon and the labdanum and styrax and so on and so forth. Mm, I love the sound of Portrait of a Lady. Um, I used to wear Joy by Jean Patou as well. I love that fragrance. Um, Gorgeous. So uh, is it fashionable? Is it an ingredient in contemporary perfume? Is it still as popular as it's ever been? It seems to be all of the perfumes that I've named are all, you know, they sell very, very well. Even the perfumes that smell more aquatic, the trend for aquatic perfumes that came out in the early 2000s and 90s, they would still contain an element of rose in them. I think people think they don't like rose, but then when you get into smell of a range of different rose perfumes, there will be one there that they tend to like. Yeah, like you say, it's it, it's amazing the different type. Of, you've only got to walk around a rose garden and smell the different mm-hmm. roses to know mm-hmm. that the, the scents are just so different of each one. And as you say, even in different locations, they'll smell different. Um, so I thought it was really, really interesting, your visit to the Osmotech. Um, oh. Can you talk about its purpose and what you did while you were there? Yes. So the Osmotech is, in the same way that you get archives for fashion textiles or anything that you'd have in a museum, you get archives for perfume. And the best one in the world is the Osmotech, which is in Versailles, not in the palace as I first thought I was going to, but it was in the town of Versailles. Now, Osmo means smell or scent, and the Osmotech is the world's largest repository of perfumes. So it authenticates, documents, preserves and reproduces more than 4,000 perfumes, 800 of which are no longer in production. And it can trace certain great perfumes that no longer exist and bring them back to life. But they also have a charter saying that they cannot produce any of these for financial gain. Wow. So they could, how do they do it? Do they kind of harvest the scent molecules Um, off of something? A lot of the companies will entrust the ingredient list or the recipe to the Osmotech and they are kept very um, tight control of. They're kept in a vault in the centre of Paris. I suppose it's like the recipe for Coca-Cola. You have to be very careful who gets their hands on it. So they have access to those recipes and they're able to then reproduce the scent because they have ingredients that are no longer allowed to be used as well and scent things that have been outlawed over time because it might be because of animal cruelty or they bring on allergies. So they're able to do that. And I was able to smell perfumes that no longer exist, which wow. was wonderful. And what, what did you go there for, just for research purposes? Well, I went because I knew I was going to write this chapter about roses. And although most of my research looks at the cultural history of roses, I wanted to understand the perfume itself. So I made an appointment. It's not open to the public. If you're a researcher, though, you can get in touch with them and um, organise an appointment. I was looked after by a person who works there called Isabel Reynaud Chazot. And... It's a very modest operation. You know, you walk in and it's just a room 
it doesn't look anything particularly special. And then they bring up the scents from downstairs and I got to try 20 of the greatest rose scents of all time. Wow. Oh, that must be amazing. How do you cleanse your palate between smelling the different perfumes? You can smell yourself. If you smell your own skin or just into the crook of your elbow, that tends to reset your nose. Huh. Wow. So you talked about, obviously, when you were younger, you tried to preserve the scent of roses. And this, mm-hmm. again, might be beyond your remit. But if people wanted to do that, is there a way you can do that at home? Oh, I don't know if you can get home distillation kits. And this, I suppose you can. Is that the, the way to do you it? distill too? your own beer. Yeah, yeah, it would need to be some sort of steam distillation. I mean, the old way would be to embed thousands of rose petals in animal fat but I don't know if anyone would fancy doing that in their house (laughs) no possibly not (laughs) possibly not (laughs) um awesome well I mean I think I've got to the end of my questions so Mm -hmm. I suppose could you just tell us about um what you're going to be doing in October in October I'm going to be giving a talk it's called Horty Couture and it's going to take place at the London College of Garden Design's Autumn Conference which will be at the Royal Botanic Gardens queue. Um, You can either get a ticket and come in person or it will be available to view live online on Saturday the 9th of October. And the purpose of the conference is to examine the relationship between fashion and flowers. So loads of designers have drawn upon the aesthetic of flowers within their own work. So Hardy Amos, Yves Saint Laurent, Christian Dior and In turn, a lot of fashion designers and people who work in fashion are keen gardeners. So this conference will bring those together and there are a number of amazing speakers at it. I'm not talking about myself there, obviously talking about the other ones. So Professor Amy Delahaye, who's the author of Ravishing the Rose in Fashion. Um, Justine Pickardy, who's the author of the forthcoming book Miss Dior. And Sam McKnight, who's an absolutely legendary hairstylist and who's an apt gardener as well. And Jeffrey Munn, who is one of the experts in the Antique Roadshow. He's an expert in jewellery. So we'll be looking at um, roses and floral symbolism within jewellery. And I'll be talking about the history of perfume and flowers. Thank you, Mary. As Mary said, she'll be speaking at the London College of Garden Design's Haughty Couture Conference in October. The conference will explore the influence of plants and gardens on the fashion world and features some of the industry's leading academics and influencers. For more information, visit the LCGD website, lcg.org.uk, or their Eventbrite page. Tickets start at £59, and the day will be streamed online as well as in person at Kew Gardens. And I'm going to be there, which I'm very excited about. So please come and say hello if you're there. Thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to visit lechuza.co.uk to find out more about their indoor and outdoor planters which feature a built-in irrigation system. To play you out, here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a moth that I was lucky enough to see at close quarters recently as it became trapped in a polytunnel. And up close, it has a face just like an owl. Although hummingbirds don't exist wild in Britain, we'll sometimes be lucky enough to see a creature in our gardens during the summer months that could easily be mistaken for one. Since this little creature, just an inch long and half the size of the world's smallest hummingbird, is remarkably similar in the way that it darts amongst the garden plants, then skillfully hovers in front of a flower to feed. But look closely, though, at the front of its head, and you won't see a long thin beak, but a proboscis that it uncoils to probe deep into the flowers to suck out the nectar. And a pair of black antennae on top of its head also confirms that it's not a bird, but an insect, and that it's a day-flying moth called the hummingbird hawk moth. A spectacular creature with large piercing eyes and a furry-looking grey-coloured head and black and white checkered body. Rarely seen resting, its browny-grey forewings and orange hindwings beat so fast that they create an audible hum and appear as a blurry haze around the moth as it hovers. Although seen throughout Britain during the summer months, the hummingbird hawk moth is actually an annual migrant, originating from countries around the Mediterranean basin and Central Asia. And so the numbers arriving here will fluctuate from year to year. But during its stay here, it will successfully breed, laying eggs on ladies' bed straw and wild madder that hatch into green caterpillars with a yellow stripe along their sides and a blue horn on their rear. 
and these will go on to pupate and emerge as adult moths during late summer. Although it's assumed that they then can't hibernate and survive through our winter. However, Britain's climate is changing, and the warmer winters might soon enable hummingbird hawk moths to become a resident species and a regular sight in our gardens, drawn in to feed by the rich fragrances from plants such as red valerian, buddleia, jasmine and phlox. And if so, then maybe we should consider planting some ladies' bed straw in the flower beds as well, for their eggs and their caterpillars to develop on. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.